Hello friends and welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. This is Jess and today we are going to be hanging out here in my kitchen and I am going to talk to you about saving seeds. So this is kind of the story um, of my kitchen table this time of year. Especially on a day like today where I am saving a lot of seeds. I'm going to be uh, processing some of these tomatoes and these peppers. Before we get into the how of saving seeds, let's talk about why. I save seeds in order to save money. Essentially, if I buy a packet of a certain kind of seed one time and then grow it, I can save seeds from that fruit from then on out and I don't have to buy that type of seed again. The other thing is, is I really enjoy the community of uh, seed sharing and just, you know, talking with other gardeners. Um, I take part in a couple of different seed swaps every year on Instagram. I will link my Instagram account below if you'd like to follow that. I generally post about those and they're hosted by other people. I am toying with the idea of hosting a swap myself but if I do that it won't be until this fall uh, after you know all the harvest is done and there are lots of seeds to be shared. I do buy a lot of seeds even though I save a lot. Um, some of my favorite places are Baker Creek, Seeds Now, Trade Winds Fruit. There are a couple others that kind of specialize in more rare stuff which I will also link to those websites down below if you are looking in to getting into like rare varieties and less heard of heirlooms. One thing to understand before you get into seed savings is cross-pollination. Essentially all that means is that the pollen from one type can pollinate the flower of a different variety of the same type. For instance, if you've got a Cherokee purple tomato as well as a sweetie cherry tomato and they're growing next to each other either by the wind blowing that pollen or an insect carrying that pollen, what you could end up with is a fruit that has seeds in it which carry the genetics of both of those plants. Essentially, if one of those plants pollinates the other one, your seeds are not going to be pure seeds. Uh, you could have a cherry tomato that has seeds inside of it that when you plant them grow a larger tomato if it has crossed with something that is a larger variety. However, the pollen from a tomato plant, it can't pollinate a cucumber. It has to be within the same strain even though it could be different variety. Which means if you're growing an heirloom and you want to have seeds that will grow that same heirloom, you're going to have to take some sort of measures against cross-pollination. Now the simplest way to do that is only grow one of each type of plant in your garden. One squash, um, one watermelon, one tomato. However, uh, that's not very fun and my guess is if you are watching this video, you want to have more than one type of variety in your garden. Another suggestion to avoid cross-pollination is to grow plants far enough away that cross-pollination isn't a concern. However, the agreed upon space is generally like a hundred yards apart. That's a big space and um, that might work if you were planting multiple gardens uh, across your large property. However, for me, I only have four and a half acres um, and I could maybe set up three or four growing spaces like that. Therefore, grow three or four types of plants without worrying about cross-pollination, but that's just not going to happen. Basically, what I've got is a really big garden where everything is going to be planted close together. So in order to avoid cross-pollination, what I use um, is called blossom bags. You can buy uh, blossom bags that are marketed specifically for the purpose of seed saving, or you can just use little mesh party favor bags that will allow the wind to blow through but not allow uh, pollen or specifically insects to get through. These are just like a double layer of mesh and they have a drawstring. So what you do is when the plant sets its flowers before the flowers are open, like a tomato or a pepper, that's typically what I use these on is a tomato or a pepper. They set little bunches of flowers and you slip this down um, over that branch that has the flowers and you tighten it over there so that all of the flowers when they open, they'll be contained inside this bag. And what I do is whenever I go past it, you know, as I'm just walking throughout my garden during the mornings, I'll just shake that branch and that means that those flowers that are inside this bag, they will pollinate one another because a plant essentially pollinates itself unless there's another plant nearby and they either touch or, you know, an insect carries pollen. And then after 
those fruits set on that particular stem that's covered. Then you take the bag off and what I'll typically do is tie like a little ribbon or a string around that branch so that I know those are the fruits that I'm going to harvest to save the seeds because those particular fruits I can be sure have the genetics of that plant only. The thing is with tomatoes and uh, peppers, peppers are a little more um, likely to cross pollinate. Tomatoes actually a lot of times don't. Um, I do have mine planted really closely together and a lot of times what I'll do is if I want to save the seed for one variety, I will make sure I plant at least three of those plants and then I save the seeds off the middle one. Um, or typically if it's something that I really want to keep the seeds for, if it was something rare or if it was something that I really love and I know I definitely want to have seeds when I use the blossom bags. But as far as saving seeds for myself, um, I don't mind the risk that they might be mixed. So I'll just save the seeds off the middle plant. So the next family of plants, we've got tomatoes that we've talked about, peppers, and there's cucurbits, which this is the gourd family, which includes watermelons, pumpkins, squashes, both winter and summer, uh, cucumbers, all of these things fall into the same family and therefore they can cross pollinate one another. Typically the standard for cucurbits is to hand pollinate, which means that as soon as um, that flower opens, it takes a lot of attention. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take a clean paintbrush and you are going to take the pollen from one flower from that particular plant and you are going to hand pollinate the just open flower of the same plant. You might put a blossom bag over it beforehand just so that if you miss the opening, you can take the bag off, pollinate it, put the bag back on, close it. Um, a lot of times for squash blossoms, what people will do is they will hand pollinate and then they will tie that blossom closed with like a string to make sure that no bee comes along behind you and pollinates that flower in case you didn't get the job done. That is a lot of work. To be honest, I have not done that. I have not uh, hand pollinated for the sake of saving seeds. I've hand pollinated for the sake of getting fruit. Um, it, for instance, if your blossoms just keep falling off of your cucumber plant or your squash plant, but no fruit begins to form, it might be from a lack of pollinators, at which point you can take the paintbrush, do the hand pollination, and therefore the fruit will set and you get to harvest it. However, I've never done the like tying things off and trying to protect it from other pollinators coming. I've only ever done it to aid in pollination so that I can get my fruit this year, not for the sake of saving seeds. So today I'm actually gonna be saving the seeds from a couple of squashes and cucumbers and I don't know if they are going to provide a pure seed. So what I'll do is for instance, I've got this Armenian white cucumber that I'm gonna save the seeds for. Now this is one fruit, so this came from one flower. That flower was either cross-pollinated or it wasn't. What determines the genetics of this fruit is the pollen that touch this flower. Um, if a bee came and pollinated every other uh, flower on this plant with pollen from another plant, but this one was pollinated with the Armenian white cucumber pollen, this will be the seeds for a pure Armenian white cucumber. What I'll do is I'll save the seeds and I'll put it in a bag and I'll write Armenian white cucumber on the bag and I'll write maybe cross pollinated. Uh, then I will test it. I'll probably actually test this again this year because I have enough time in the growing season to grow it again. And if the fruit that it grows is Armenian white, if it has got the characteristics of this particular variety of, of fruit, I'll know that I have pure seed. So I'll go back to my bag and I'll mark out cross the maybe cross pollinated because I know that whole bag is full of all these seeds. Therefore, they're all pure because they all came from the same fruit. For me, um, when it comes to like super uh, rigorously making sure that I do everything right and avoid cross pollination, I don't mind the risk. I think it's kind of fun. It's a little bit of a gamble. I might end up with something new and cool. So I go ahead and just take the risk sometimes. I save seeds from stuff that could have possibly been open that I didn't use a blossom bag on that I didn't hand pollinate. And then I grow it and just see. I have ended up with a really cool variety of okra that was from a cross pollination. I really like it. Um, I've ended up with a couple of tomatoes that are kind of neat. 
and it's just a new variety. It's essentially an F1 hybrid that's created by crossing a couple of plants. Beans, you don't really have to worry too much about cross-pollination. They don't readily uh, cross-pollinate. When I plant my beans, I try to give them just a little bit of space in between each variety. Um, sometimes I'll plant the beans and then on the next trellis, I'll plant a cucumber plant or something that really attracts the pollinators, some flowers, zinnias, or something like that so that I don't have two bean plants right next to each other where the bees are going uh, interspersingly between the two bean plants. I don't know that that even really matters because everybody's always told me that they don't really cross pollinate readily. Same thing with flowers. They don't typically cross pollinate. So I've never gone through any extra measures to keep those seeds isolated or the flowers isolated. So can you save the seeds of a hybrid? Um, well, yes, you can. Um, and most modern hybrids, they're just F1 varieties, which basically means they are the offspring of two parent plants and they haven't been stabilized yet. In order to stabilize a hybrid, it has to be bred for many generations and the fruits that present the desired traits have to be saved. Anyway, um, essentially, yes, you can save hybrid seeds, they just probably won't produce the same exact tomato that you pulled them out of. Like, you know, an F1 hybrid that you get at the store, you buy a plant, you can save the seeds, but it you might, might have bought a cherry tomato plant and the seeds might grow a larger tomato. You might end up with a tomato with just very different characteristics. If you want to be able to save the seeds and have consistent tomatoes or plants from whatever you save seeds of, you're gonna have to get open pollinated varieties. Uh, that just means that it's a hybrid that's been stabilized. And hybrids, you've probably heard me talk about this before if you've been around here very long, hybrids in and themselves are not bad things. Hybridization only gets weird whenever you get into the world of GMOs and all of that stuff. But as far as just modern open pollinated hybrids, um, that just means that someone made a new variety and that's completely okay. So all of that lay to the side. I know that's a lot of information and so I really just wanna get on to how to save the seeds. I've got a few things here that I'm going to save the seeds for today just to show you how you handle different types of fruits and vegetables in seed saving. Within the world of botany, a fruit is just a structure that carries seeds. Uh, typically, they are armed with all kinds of flavors and aromas that would appeal and attract to something to come and eat it that that thing, that something or someone, would carry those seeds through their digestive tract and leave them in their waste and therefore the seed would be spread. Which explains why so many different foods, whenever you cut them open, the seeds are surrounded by sort of like a gel or a slime, just some sort of protective coating the purpose of that coating is to help that seed survive your digestive tract. So what is classified as a fruit? Well, a lot of the things that you grow in your garden that you might not realize are fruits, are fruits. Um, things like green beans and cucumbers and peppers, all of these things are considered fruits in the world of botany because all of them are essentially structures that hold seeds. They all start within the reproductive tract of a plant and um, the fruit is actually developed in the ovary to hold the seeds. So essentially when we eat a fruit, what we're eating is the ovary of a plant. And in the world of botany, which is the study of plants, the word vegetable really doesn't mean anything. Um, other plants are classified by what part of the plant they are. When we eat a carrot, we're actually eating a root. A uh, rhubarb is a stem, lettuce, a leaf. We're just eating parts of a plant. Whereas with fruit, we're actually eating the, the part that is designed to carry the seeds. With a vegetable, we're actually eating part of the plant. Now, what that means is essentially for vegetable seeds, for instance, carrots and lettuces, beets, radishes, all of these things, what you have to do is you have to allow them to grow, the plant to actually grow, so you do not harvest it and eat the root or else that ends the life of that plant and it can't go to seed or bolt. What you have to do if you wanna save the seeds of something like a lettuce, you have to let it run its life course. You have to let it grow far past the point of being edible so that it can then grow flowers and in those flowers, produce seeds. This is actually a bunch of the flowers that were produced on a particular type of lettuce um, that I've been growing in my garden. 
Okay, so here I have a stem of this Marvel of Four Seasons lettuce. Now, you can see here that many of these have already flowered. This looks very similar to a dandelion because they're meant to be caught on the wind. They have really light seeds. These these pods are not fully developed yet, but in a lot of cases, by the time these are open, these have already blown away, so you just have to pick it at some point when there is some seed to harvest. So what I do is I just pluck this top off, pull the flowers off, and shake this. Now lettuce seeds are very small, and I've got kind of some of this flower junk in here, but these are already very dry. Um, by the time they reach this point, the plant is very dry and it still has leaves that look a lot like lettuce but at this point they're so tough you wouldn't want to eat them and saving the seed of anything that goes to flower is very similar to this um, carrots radishes beets any sort of root vegetable any sort of greenery broccoli all of these things essentially develop flowers and within the flowers after they dry after they dry up you have these little dry seeds. Now each one of these teeny tiny little seeds produces another plant, which will produce another butter head of lettuce, which we will pick leaves off of for weeks before it gets to the point of trying to grow up and develop flowers. Um, it's incredible the multiplication that happens in saving seeds. I mean, you can just see after breaking off just a few of those little heads of flowers, we have that many seeds, which is that many more heads of lettuce. And that was just a tiny little bit. Here's more of those. And this is not even, this is not even a tenth of what's on that plant right now. There's a ton of flowers. There's a ton of seeds to save. Now beans are somewhat similar, um, though they are considered fruits. Essentially, you are saving the part that you eat. You can actually buy bagged dry beans at the store and plant them, um, like pinto beans or navy beans. You can grow the beans from those ba dry bags because they're, they're essentially just seeds. Okay, so with a bean, you're gonna leave it on the plant until it is completely dry. Most of the time we harvest beans young to eat because when they get big, their pods get really tough and uh, the beans inside them tend to get a little bit bigger and, and harder. But this is very similar to uh, saving dry beans for eating. You would leave them at that point, you would leave them on the plant to dry as well and you would shell them just like this, but then cook them and eat them. We're gonna save these to, to uh, replant. So here I've got another bean that I've saved called Eye of the Goat. And they were dried up on the plant. So I just open up that pod and save the bean. Okay, here I have some dried up calendula flowers. Now as you can see, most of these seeds just kind of fell off pretty willingly. They look just like this. And um, basically these flowered, and as is the case with all flowers, you have to wait until they, um, they completely flower and then they died back and then in, off the dead flower that is dried up is how you save the seeds. And that's, that's pretty much the case with flowers, um, but the seeds are all different. Some of them are incredibly small. But in this case with the calendula flower, their seeds are quite large and they literally just, they're very obvious. Peppers are also quite easy to save. Um, I don't really have any that are quite to the point of being able to save the seeds. You just want to leave the fruit on the plant until it is full size. Um, you know that point where the skin kind of starts to just wrinkle up a little bit. It's completely changed to whatever color that it's supposed to be at full ripeness. And they, they just begin to shrink down on itself. You don't want to wait till it's rotting or anything, but you want to make sure it's completely ripe. They're Therefore, the seeds are completely developed. You just take it off. Um, very simply, you pop off the top. This one's really, this one was a little bit young, so I'm not gonna do that. You pop off the top, take all of those pepper seeds. Um, I like to put them on like a paper plate uh, or like a paper towel and just leave them sitting out on the counter for a day or so until they're completely dried up. Then you can put them away, label them, and they're good to go. 
things get a little bit more difficult when you get into the fruits that have that gel um, or slick slimy coating on them. Um, things like tomatoes, cucumbers, all of these need to have their seeds fermented before you save them. And that's what's going to dissolve that coating and uh, put your seed into a place where you can keep it dry. So the way I do this is, uh, this is a Parisian pickling cucumber. Um, this is actually a gherkin cucumber variety. So when we pick these to eat them, they're about this big. They're so green and have bumps all over them. So what I've done is I've left this on the plant until it got as big as it was gonna get. This is fully ripe. Now I bring it in the house, um, just cut it in half. And of course it has all of those beautiful seeds inside. I get a spoon and I just scoop these out into a mason jar. You can use any sort of cup. I like to use a mason jar because I have five billion of them and because it's clear so I can see through it. So I've got the seeds and all of that pulp. So as you can see, each of these seeds has this little bubble of gel around it. And that's what we're trying to remove by fermenting these. And this is gonna work the same for any sort of cucumber, typically any sort of melon. Um, we're getting them out, we're putting in this jar all the pulp, so all the gels down in there and all the seeds. So I have these glass markers that I got on Amazon um, that I use to label our kombucha. And I will mark on the side of this glass what that is, Parisian pickling cuke. And I'm just gonna take a little bit of water Fill this jar about halfway up, and as you can see, um, we've got all of our gel, all of our seeds, and what I'm gonna do is just set this on the counter and let it ferment for a couple of days. Generally, two does the trick. This is the one I just set down. It's labeled Parisian Pickling Cucumber. This is the seeds from a melon from the other day, and here, are some seeds from a cucumber that I saved just a couple days ago. So let's go ahead and strain these. So that's gonna sit on your counter for a couple of days, twice a day. Take it and you just pick up the jar and, and just give it a little swirl so it's mixing around in there. If you have an issue with regular flies or fruit flies and it's causing a problem for you to have like an open container of something fermenting on your counter, um, they make these fermenting lids. I know a few brands sell them. These are just the cheap ones from Amazon. And that kind of comes and goes for us just depending on different stages of summer. We actually don't have fruit flies real bad right now, but occasionally we get them. And uh, I'll use these fermenting lids on top of the jar right now. I, ha I have no need for them. They're doing okay without it. I will put that link down below though in case that's something you think you might need. So this, this is the jar of cucumber seeds from a couple days ago and I'm about to strain them and I'll give you a look. All right, notice there are some seeds floating at the top. Those are not viable. See, even when they're pushed down, they float back up. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna scoop everything off the top that's floating in this jar. Then I'm going to just pour these into a really fine strainer and I'm gonna rinse them off really well. Next, I need to make a place for these to dry. Plate and a couple of paper towels, which you can use, if you don't do paper towels, you can use like a flour sack towel. I've used those before if I don't have paper towels because I don't always keep them. The benefit of using paper towels is that you can write on here what your variety is. Okay, I'll shake these off down here and I'm just going to Put them on this paper towel, oh, there goes my label, and spread them out in a nice thin layer. Now, a lot of times I'll just set these right here on top of my um, dehydrator, which is kind of my catch-all place for letting seeds dry out. You see I've got some beans up here that were still just a little bit moist. When you are laying seeds out to dry, or putting them in a jar to ferment, you do wanna put that out of direct sunlight. You don't wanna put it in a like, super sunny windowsill or right inside of window. Just let them dry naturally um, so that they dry evenly. Now here is a set of uh, collective farm woman melon seeds that 
I saved a few days ago and they've been sitting on this paper towel in my pantry for a few days so now they're completely dry. You'll be able to feel them and tell you want them to be completely dried out. You do not want to put seeds that have any sort of moisture up because they will mold. I save my seeds in plastic bags. The reason I do that is because it keeps moisture out. You just have to make completely sure that you're not locking any moisture in. I've done it like this for a long time. Um, I prefer it whenever seed companies send seeds in plastic bags because if a little paper envelope gets wet, all of those seeds can get ruined. I'm putting all of these in here. Now these are the seeds of one small melon. That is a couple hundred seeds at least. And I like to write the variety on the side of the bag with a, like a Sharpie marker. Those have a tendency of growing legs and running away in my house and I can never find one. So I'm just gonna use this pen. One of the biggest things to remember whenever you are saving seeds for a variety is making sure that you allow the fruit that you're going to save the seeds from to get to its full size. Um, I don't know if you guys remember uh, several weeks ago when I was first doing the garden tours, I was growing a particular kind of squash called Ron Denise and it was this cute little softball sized green round squash. It was delicious. However, um, I missed one on the plant and it started to get really large and so I just left it. I thought, well, I'd like to save the seeds for that. This is it. Um, definitely not the same thing that it was before. So I left it until it stopped growing, it changed colors. Now this is a completely different thing. I mean, it's got super tough skin. I'm having a hard time even cutting into it, but this is what you need in order to save the seeds. Goodness, that was no small task. This rind is hard. So these actually aren't going to need to be fermented because you see how dry they are. And these are just kind of like pumpkin seeds. Um, they're just big and they're already pretty dry so they don't have any sort of like gel coating so for these i'll just lay these out on a single layer on like a paper towel label it and lay them out until they're completely dry and then we will i'll put them up All right, let's talk tomatoes. This is very much the same process as you would save any other wet seed. Now just a couple of tips that I like to do. Um, of course, I do use the blossom bags for the variety where I want to make sure I don't have any cross pollination. I am willing to take the risk on some other ones, some that I might have liked okay, but you know, I won't be heartbroken if it doesn't grow in my garden the next year. This is a pink Berkeley tie-dye. This was not in a blossom bag. However, this fruit got pretty damaged by insects and it split really bad on the bottom. So if I were to try to eat this, I would have to cut a lot of it away. And so for me, this is a great opportunity to save these seeds. A lot of times I will pick the fruits that look really good, but that somehow got messed up. If one got really bad sun scald, or if it did get a lot of insect damage, um, you know, if you come out one day and you've got a tomato that got half eaten by a squirrel or something like that, a lot of times you can save the seeds and then you salvage something from that fruit and it's not a total loss. What I do is I just cut into it. Um, I've got my jar right here and I'm just going to scoop all of that gel and those seeds out into uh, my jar. Now, if you get some like chunks of the fruit in there, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, they will float to the top during the fermentation process and uh, separate themselves from the seeds. All your good viable seeds are gonna sink to the bottom and all of the junk is gonna float to the top. Okay, so I got all of those little gel pockets that were in here cleared out. And I've got all of this pulp with the seeds in the jar, so I'm gonna go put water in this and I'm gonna set it down to begin fermenting. This is also the same. It's just gonna be a few days of fermenting. You can kind of tell by looking at it when um, all of your pulp and seeds have really separated and you can tell the seeds no longer have that kind of jelly bubble around them. You don't want to leave them fermenting too long because essentially what happens after that two or three day mark, that seed no longer has its protective coating and so it will begin to break down in the water if you leave it in there for several days. With um, a lot of things, you can actually still eat 
the fruit after you've scooped the seeds out. Now a lot of the flavor of tomatoes is in that gel around the seeds, so your tomato not, might not taste as good, but a lot of times what I'll do with these is if I've scooped the seeds out to save them, I'll go ahead and process that meat along with other tomatoes to make sauce so that I'm not wasting the whole thing if it is a tomato that wasn't damaged to begin with. And of course the things like watermelon uh, and winter squashes, pumpkins, the things that you're going to be eating fully ripe whenever you cut into them, you just scoop the seeds out and continue to eat uh, eat the flesh of that fruit. Like watermelons, whenever you're eating it, you can save those seeds when you spit them out. Um, however, a lot of things like cucumbers, you have to let the fruit get way past the point that it's even edible in order to save the seeds out of it. So what I do whenever I have, you know, a really bitter, hard, large cucumber that I've taken the seeds out of, that just goes to like the chickens or the pigs so that it's not wasted. Um, a couple of things that I didn't have to show you today. Um, okra. Okra is really easy to save, especially since it just like grows super fast. Sometimes you'll miss them and you really have to harvest the pods young in order for them to be edible. They get really hard really fast. So in order to save okra, you just let it completely grow up and dry on the plant and then you pull it off. I mean, you can literally shake it when it's that dry and because the seeds dry up and you just open, open the pot up and save the seeds out of it. When you get into herbs, and flowers. Um, I cannot exactly tell you the, the right thing to do because I don't, I haven't saved a lot of those seeds. Um, they just, so many of those seeds typically come in a pack and I've never even used an entire pack in planting before. So I just have a lot of them, so I don't save them. However, uh, with something like basil, what I've done is when those herbs go to flowers, I just break off once it's completely flowered and it's starting to, the, the stem, the stalk with all the flowers is drying up. What I've done is just broken that pod off laid it out on a towel to completely dry and then once it was completely dry i just stripped the flowers off the pot into a bag and then whenever i go to plant it the next year um i have not extracted all the tiny little seeds but i've got these flowers that have the seeds in them and i just sprinkle those in my soil to plant them the last part about storing your seeds is that you want to put them in a cool dry place because seeds essentially need moisture and heat in order to germinate. Therefore, um, keeping them cool and dry will allow them to last a lot longer. Um, now, their germination rate is going to go down year after year af of storing them. However, they can be viable for several years. Um, I recently watched a thing on MI Gardener where he had ended up receiving uh, some seed packets they were like 87 years old and he successfully germinated and grew some of those seeds which is pretty cool so um that's obviously not the norm but i have grown seeds that i've had for seven or eight years at this point successfully that's about the extent of my knowledge when it comes to seed saving which i'm happy to share with you guys i hope that it helps you and i hope that you feel empowered to save your seeds you absolutely can if nothing else it is so exciting it's a great experience. It can save you some money. Um, it's fun. Don't stress about it. I stopped worrying about cross-pollination or any of that stuff a while ago, and now I just totally enjoy saving seeds for everything just because I want to grow them and see what happens. So I bless you guys. I thank you so much for watching. Until next time.